Katie Lopez is a woman with resilience. She is the founder and creative director of sustainable underwear brand Stripe and Stare, but her journey to get there has been anything but smooth sailing. Katie has faced more than your average setback. And today she tells me about the tools she used to overcome finding out that her husband and therefore herself were 1.5 million pounds in debt, a relationship breakdown at the same time and a heartbreaking loss. And to come out on the other side with a growing company and growing self-confidence. She says, I didn't have the confidence in myself until life tested me and I had no choice. Her story is incredible. She is incredibly open about it and a real testament to the fact that sometimes you just have to put your big girl pants on and find a way through. I cannot wait for you to hear her story and what she's learned from it. Before we get into the podcast, if you could please make sure to go and like and subscribe to the channel. It helps us have incredible conversations like this one, helps us to get amazing guests on and we can't wait for you to see what we have in store lots to do. I've just been planning out my day. However, with Revolut as my main account, I've got one less thing to worry about, money. I know my money's safe with Revolut, so I can focus on other important matters like planning a wedding. That is why I pay with Revolut. If Revolut detects anything suspicious with your transfer, you'll receive an in-app warning straight away. And how cool is this? You create a single-use card in the app with just one tap, and then after the purchase is made, your details disappear immediately, so they cannot be reused. Now, if you happen to lose or misplace your card, which is never a fun time for anyone, but a surprisingly regular occurrence for me, you can freeze your card instantly through the Revolut app. And if there's anything I do need help with, Revolut's customer service team are on hand 24 seven via the in-app chat. It is a huge reassurance for me and just one of the many reasons why Revolut is the main account for all of my finances. But don't just take my word for it, over 35 million people around the world trust Revolut with their money. Join us and create your account today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited. <laughs> um, and as I do with everyone, I want to start at the very beginning. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about what your life was like growing up. Yeah, sure. I'm um, not particularly exciting. I grew up in Devon in the middle of nowhere. Proper sort of rural kind of um, wild childhood. The doors used to just open first thing in the morning. I was one of four. And I don't think we wore shoes. It makes us sound like we were really feral. My mum will get really upset, but... We just had freedom, you know, so we just used to run around. And if we didn't come home for lunch, it was no big deal. We were just out and about. So really independent, but free spirited and a lot of fun. I had two big brothers who kind of teased me incessantly. And yeah, we all just grew up as a like, kind of like bundle of children and dogs and all of that sort of thing. And did you ever think at that age or at any point kind of when you're at school that you were going to be an entrepreneur? Absolutely not. Like, I'm quite a lot older than you. I'm 47. And then even more so than now, just you just wouldn't have thought of it as a right. woman growing up. Um, I wanted to be a doctor or an actress or God knows, I had no idea basically, but I was obsessed with film and cinema. So I, knew, I was also really interested in doing something in production. Mm. But there were a couple of telltale signs that this might happen. I set up a video club at school. You guys won't even know what, a, a, do you remember, a, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah no, I do. So <laughs> I used to have, I used to, I went around school and I got, everybody to tell me what was in their VHS collection at home. Mm. And then I had a, basically a rental service. So you I'd were be like, Netflix. You invented Netflix. I, well, it was Blockbuster Video, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and then they invented Netflix. So I, that was my little entrepreneurial school project. And the other thing we used to do is we lived next door to my grandmother and she had this beautiful garden. And I used to... So on Sunday afternoon, she'd open it to the public. So all these people would have to walk past our house to get to her garden. And my sister and I would set up a table outside our house... We'd go around the house and collect objects and put like a sticker on saying 50p. So we were basically selling off our parents' entire contents of their home to these people who were going away with like these beautiful china vases. So I think there was something <laughs> there in entrepreneurialism and retail, but I didn't, there was no grand plan. I haven't quite pinpointed it yet. <laughs> Less scalable, selling your grand <laughs> <laughs> And got in quite a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> so let's talk about your move into TV. Why did you want to get into TV? Well, so I did um, uni in Newcastle. I did. I loved psychology, actually. That was what I studied. And then I was one of those people, actually, who probably shouldn't have gone to university because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But I did know that I was desperate to work in film and TV. I just loved that whole set culture. So every uni holidays, I would be a runner. Literally, I would, in those days, nothing was digital. So you, being a runner 
meant you literally were carrying tapes of film around Soho from one place to the next. But um, I was just trying to get a break into the industry. I, I knew that, that I wanted to be on film sets. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew that I wanted to be in that world. Um, and then eventually I would rather have worked in film, um, but I, I got offered a job in a TV station, so I took that instead. Mm. Um, but that was it was good. I was started as a PA and I went in and I said, I just wanted a foot in the door. And I said, I'll come and be a PA for you for a year as long as you get me a job on a set at the end of it. And how did that work out? It was good. It was good. They did actually. But I, but I, weirdly, I sort of transferred to Australia. So I did a year with working for this lady in television. And then I'm half Australian. So I wanted to go and live in Sydney. And they had a sister company there. So they got me a, a job on set over there. And why did you end up leaving TV if it was something that, you know, at the beginning you thought was so I know, much kind I know. of the end goal? I let, so I started in TV as um, typical like production assistant, researcher, and then I got offered this really big promotion to, I would have been like the youngest producer, I think, at Channel 7 at that time. Um, and I'd worked so hard to get there and I, it, I loved the job. But the thing that put me off was I'd had a lot of female bosses and so I was kind of on track to the executive producer role. And I was looking at these women and the sacrifices they were making in their personal lives. They were all, I just remember one boss constantly on the phone to her daughter saying, sorry, darling, I'm not going to make it. And, you know, and I was like, these women work so hard and they're just making so many sacrifices. It's like you can't have both in this industry. So that was, so I turned that job down. My boss literally couldn't believe it because he knew how hard I'd work for it. Um, and I said, I'm, I want to, I want to go and do something different and I want to be able to control my life. I want to, I don't have a family. I wasn't, didn't even have a boyfriend at the time, but mm -hmm. I said at some point I do want to have a family, but I also want to work super hard. So what is a life that I could create for myself, which will give me the opportunity to do both? What did you feel the job that would be able to give you both was? So because I'd been living in Australia, my sister was there at the same time. We just felt there were so many amazing Australian brands mm. that weren't available in England why we decided to do fashion retail, I just, I still don't know. I just, no, it's not a lifestyle business. It is not a lifestyle no, business. It's a terrible lifestyle <laughs> business to choose. I know, now whenever we talk about retail, I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. no. Yeah. But we knew that going in, like we, we were quite smart. We did, not smart, clever, but we, you know, we'd done a lot of research. We'd done business plans and all of that kind of thing. And we knew we had to find a subsidiary business to back mm. the retail because that was never going to make us hugely profitable right so we were always looking for something to back it with yeah we knew we'd find something but actually the retail then ended up doing better than we thought it was going to right um and sort of cover some years it was profitable some years it broke even some years it made a loss so it was like that constant oh I think we can get there I think we can get there I think we can get to a really healthy profit if we just do this and that and that but actually then things like the credit crunch happened in 2008 and it was like this is very very difficult so at this stage in retail, you were running your own business. Could you tell me a little bit about that business? Yeah, it was great. It was really hard work. It was in um, on the Kings Road in Chelsea. And it was amazing, actually. Like between 2004 when we opened and 2008, we, it, times were so good. You know, London was really flourishing. We had such an amazing customer base. We had, used to get people like Sienna Miller coming in all the time. And Kate Middleton came there actually the day after she got engaged so like real moments like that. She didn't even call ahead and say, I'm coming close to the shop. She yeah. literally wandered in with her mum. And we were like, you're now the most famous woman on the planet. <laughs> and you're just doing your shopping like everybody else. It was <laughs> so low key. So there were real like moments like that. Um, and it was exciting because we were always looking for brands that you couldn't already get in London. So we were the first people to bring Zimmerman into the UK. Rag and Bone, we were the first London stockist. So there were real wins and fun times like that. But then 2008 happened and... I was like, it's going to be very, very tough now. But what I had started to do was sell a brand of lacy G-strings from America. Mm -hmm. You'll probably know the one. Um, and they were famous for being the world's most comfortable thong. Right. And women were coming in and buying armfuls of this product. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on here? Because they weren't cheap. They were like 18 pounds for right. a rolled up ball of lace. Um, but women would buy like 10 at a time. So then I got really interested in underwear. And I was like, well, the more research I did, I realized that actually underwear... It's probably a bit like um, what you do. Once women find a brand of underwear, they're more loyal to it. Right. They, again, they go back and buy the same thing yeah. again and again. So that really interested me. And I love the simplicity. Selling fashion, I love the simplicity of an underwear that's non-seasonal, 
really simple sizing, not lots of SKUs. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, well, it's great that we've got this thong, but we're British and we like a pair of pants. So I was, there was no one making a super sort of cool, soft, sustainable pair of knickers for every single day. Um, and it was also a time we were beginning to understand the damage that fashion was doing to the planet. So I was trying to find a sustainable fiber that could do all of that as well. Mm. Um, and yeah, so basically well, I didn't really realize it, but I couldn't find anyone doing it. So I couldn't find it to buy into the store. So I just started doing little production runs. I got my mum to make the first prototype on her sewing machine because I can't sew. Sorry, mum. <laughs> and um, sent it. I, met, I used to go to Asia a lot for sourcing trips. So just sent it to a factory um, that I'd met and said, could you make some samples? And it literally went from there. We'd do small production runs. I'd sell them through the store. What do you like? What don't you like? Every single day to our customers. And then on the new production run, I'd tweak all the changes. So that went on for about quite a long time, about six, eight years. But by the end of it, it became our best selling thing in the store. Really? And then Alana Weston, who was the chairwoman of Selfridges, because she's deeply passionate about sustainability, she got given a pair and literally got her office called and said, How quickly can you come and start selling Selfridges? So I was like, Hmm. And the retail was so hard. It was so, so hard, mm. as we've just talked about. You know, by the time you've paid your rent, your staff, your cost of goods, there's nothing left over and you're working seven days a week. Mm. And I had small children at this point and it was just unsustainable. So um, I then spoke to the ShopBot buyers, which is a big American retailer and said, you American women don't wear knickers, do you? You all wear thongs. And she was like, actually, no, the younger, cooler customers they're actually pivoting more to a fuller brief shape. It's kind of cooler mm. because technology's moved on so you can get it without the VPLs and stuff. Um, so it was at that moment that I really realized that I had something that was glo globally scalable um, with volume appeal and much more simple than what I've been doing. And this at this point, was this called Cheek Frills? So the early prototypes were called Cheek Frills. Um, and yeah, we had such, it was so amazing. We got we were actually got picked, they were put in the V&A um, because they were doing a retrospective of women's underwear and how women's rights have mirrored trends in underwear. That's like the so life. interesting. It's so cool. So we were next to a corset and it was like, that's the past and this is the future. Honestly, when you're making just like a fun pair of knickers and the v &A call you up and say, can we put your underwear in our exhibition? You're a bit like, why would you want to do that? But, <laughs> but <yeah>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a cool moment. But yeah, so then Cheek Frills was um, the early prototype stage. And then we, I mean, honestly, people don't believe my story. We then got sued for trademark infringement. See, we'd done all the tests, all the tre checks, the company trademark checks, and had the all clear. But it was still going through the actual formal legal process. Um, but we'd already launched it. So that was a huge learning. Is We then got a letter from this company in Austria saying you're too close to our trademark cheek which anyway to cut a very long very long story short um the lawyers said you'll win but the problem is is the people we were fighting had bottomless pits of cash right so I wish I'd given up the brand name sooner that was a real lesson is know who you're up against I think mm -hmm. if some if you get into a legal wrangle even if you might be in the right if they've got lots and lots of money, there's not a huge amount you can do about it. So yeah, so that was um, so we that was why we then started Stripe and Stare is because then it was we had to start with a new name and a new team and all of that sort of thing. Right, that must have been really hard to get through at that time. Where it was a really bad moment because it was also the moment that I was getting divorced and my personal life was basically disintegrating mm. at the same moment. I think the universe is very funny at the way that everything does seem to come at once. It's mm. never, you sort of go over periods that are really calm and chilled and then suddenly it's like, oh, yeah. what did I need to learn here? <laughs> when it rains, it pours. Exactly. So yeah. let's talk about that if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, so you're at a point where you've developed a prototype, your business is growing, you're getting a huge amount of kind of success and recognition for it and it feels like you've really kind of probably struck gold in a certain area. I knew I had an amazing product. Yeah. I knew that to the very depths of my soul because anyone who tried it said it was the best, most comfortable underwear they'd the ever worn. Which is the best thing to hear when yeah. you have a product. Like it really it's is. Course. It's the hardest thing to get right so that then, from then the marketing feels easy because I the product's amazing. I wonder if you don't have that like deep to your bones knowledge that you've got a great product in the way Tala is. Like if you don't have that, because it's so tough, isn't it? Everything's mm -hmm. it, running a business, even if it's a, 
touch wood successful one it's still fucking tough mm. so yeah no having that n- absolute belief in what you're doing is essential and at this point when you kind of feel like everything's very much on the app I know that kind of the rug was completely pulled out from underneath so you. the trademark thing was happening and then I uh I was married um yeah so basically I had the week from hell so on Sunday my father died after a long battle with cancer Monday, I found out my now ex-husband had been living a financial lie and we'd sold our house to fund his business. So we were in a rented house that basically didn't have a roof over our heads and I was like one and a half million pounds in debt. And then on Thursday, I was at my father's funeral and I got a call saying, your house has been burgled, like top to bottom. So yeah, people always do that face. Mm. <laughs> people are like, really, is this girl just demented? Like, is she making this up? Because that just can't be real. And you do, you're like, why me? Why, why has this happened to me? Why do I have to go through this? And But yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's it a, was a lot. lot. It was a lot. But I am actually grateful for it which sounds strange because I think these are the moments where you find out who you are, what you can do. It was a really long process. Like it took me years and years to rebuild, to get over it. Yeah. All of that stuff. So I want to touch on that because I think that, you know, anyone who's going through something that really feels like rock bottom will definitely appreciate it. I think that, you know, you can expect some things to happen, but I can imagine your ex-husband husband at the time saying you know this is what you think the case is actually this is the reality how did that feel when you were told that um it was it was just total shock like there'd been a few red flags probably along the way but I really I just I trusted him so deeply and he'd been in finance that was his world so I, he kind of ran I feel like such a naive stupid woman for saying this now and it's my big lesson I've got a 15 year old daughter and I'm like Connie you take responsibility for your financial life every step of the way I think it's probably quite different for you when I growing up it was definitely a very patriarchal household you know like not that my dad ran the house you know he was an amazing man but you know, the man did, was in charge, basically. And I think probably because he was in the city in, I think, 2008, had a real impact on him, probably mentally. And he went from having a very solid, the person you could trust with your life, to that not being the case. Maybe he felt like he couldn't provide for us. I don't know, because he Mm. wasn't open about it. Mm. And he pretended everything was fine. Um, So you you found out that you were 1.5 million in debt from his doing? That's tough to swallow, I can imagine. It was really hard. It was Mm. really, really hard. Because we were living such a lovely life and the children were at lovely schools in London. But so, yeah, it took about two years, I would say, to rebuild and get to a point where I kind of felt back to normal. What's normal, but you know what I mean? Like, it was two years of... I think I was in shock, actually, for a really long time after, like, two years. I can't imagine. Like, I I don't think we're we're programmed to get through anything like that. It really was too much. Yeah. And how did you emotionally get through that? Um, I think probably there were moments when I really didn't, but I think um, slow and steady, there's no, there was never going to be a quick fix. There was no, I just remember all my friends and family around me just looking at me like, fuck, how are we going to help her? Like, what can we do? And there was just nothing that anyone could do. I moved out of London, which is why I've moved back to Devon, because I had a support system there, much cheaper with the small children. My brother was really sweet and had a house that we could live in. Um, So I was so lucky, so, so lucky that I had an amazing group of friends and my family, big family. They pulled me through, I think. Mm. And obviously you talk about how that's changed your outlook on relying on someone financially or kind of expecting something to be taken care of that you don't you know you don't have oversight over what kind of tangible things would you tell yourself or your daughter in order to kind of make sure you had that mindset like at the very beginning of when I think that it's happened. that. I think it's accountability. 
it was probably too easy for me to, and not fair on him as well in a way to just expect him to run everything you know and I should have made sure made sure I knew what was going on and not just blindly trusted somebody also trusting your instincts I think there's a part of me probably that is from this very old-fashioned family which probably slightly thought that men knew better than women it's awful to say and you're 20 years younger so hopefully your generation is a little bit more savvy and confident I think um in their own abilities I don't think I had any faith I think I genuinely thought the men knew better at that point it had sort of been brainwashed into me that men are the sort of clever ones who take care of things whereas women just uh there just to, right. and if they do have a nice job it's that's great good for them but right. it was a real like fuck you universe fuck you everything I've ever been told fuck everything I was yeah. fucking angry I was like how I'm actually quite clever quite capable like I'm not like a genius or anything but I'm perfectly capable of running my own life but I hadn't had that belief I don't think and so how has all of this changed your mindset I think when you're faced with no option, literally no option, than to get up and make something happen, you just do it. But it's made me believe in myself. It's made me find out who I am. It's made me trust my instincts. It's made me realize how much more capable I am than I ever thought I was. Because mm. now look, I've got a 15 year old who's so happy taking over the world. God, she's confident. I'm like, where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> Probably growing up with you going through that. Her and, and her girl, you do girl. That. Well, they're all like it. I'm like, they do not take any shit from boys, from nothing. They're so, they have that internal, like real strength and self belief. It's, it's amazing to see. I love it. And then I've got an 11 year old, you know, and they're really happy children. They just normal, just, you know, touch wood, no big traumas have come out from all the drama yet, but they seem really on it and good. Um, and then obviously I've got Stripe and Stare, which I'm so proud of because um, it's been so much easier. You know, you take your learnings from the first business you've had and really like, there's a lot of mistakes I think you can avoid second time round. And so did you start Stripe and Stare up from scratch after the trademark yeah, situation. So, um, so moved to Devon and then started Stripers there in 2017. And how did you have the, I don't want to use the word motivation, how did you have the kind of ability to, while going through that, to start a business from scratch as well? Because it's not just that you've, you know, you found out that your husband is 1.5 million in debt and therefore you are as well. It's not just that you've obviously very tragically lost a family member. You've also lost your business from, you know, a yeah, trademark Yeah, that was, a, that was sort of going on in the background. So right. that took about another year to kind of unfold. So I tried to make that work for another year after. But actually, I wasn't in the right headspace to even attempt to make something work. Right. I was still in like trauma and shock. And then dealing with this other big legal battle, this, this big legal battle on top of everything else that was going on. It was... Um, it was too much. It was too much. I shouldn't have tried, but I did. So did that. But then actually, um, after Sheep Frills, I said, I do not ever want to see another pair of underwear ever again in my life. I'm fucking sick of knickers after all of this drama. An angel investor came to me and said, if you ever want to start something up, I've been watching you. I'd really like to back you. Um, so that happened. And then an old friend who I'd worked with was not enjoying her job as an MD. Um, and she would want, she'd actually just left and we had a cup of coffee and I said, look, I've got this angel investor, but I don't want to do it all by myself because I've been through all of this. I'm still like recovering from everything that's gone on. Right. Um, but I knew I could do the sales, the PR, the marketing, all of that side, the product, but I, I didn't, I don't know how you do both actually. I'm really interested how you balance your brain because I then, I think if I'm in that world, I find it really hard to be in the financial operational world. Mm -hmm. So that's why I needed her to kind of be my rock, someone I could trust with my life. I think after you've been through that sort of trauma, more than ever people that you know you can rely on are mm -hmm. important. Um, so that's how we found it, basically really small, basically 70K of investment. We did that on purpose. We Someone actually then offered us more. We were like, no, 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 we just want to, do things organically, slowly, because then, God, this sounds like I'm making up some sort of traumatic horror story. Her husband died in his sleep, sort of just after we decided to found the business. So it was really weird. I, th I think, again, the universe brought us together because it was my kind of healing 
working in that very small, gentle way. And that's what she needed to help mm. get her through the trauma of grief as well. So it's just weird that we were both went through these amazingly terrible, tragic things. But we kind of had each other. We had the business. But the business did exactly what I wanted it to do. It allowed me to be a mother to my children and therefore all the, all the important moments. It allowed me to work really hard, but completely on my own terms when I want to work. I ask, sometimes stay out really late, but it means that I can go to a netball match the next right. day or whatever. So it, it's been it's been a real healing, cathartic part of the process. I think the success of Stripe and Stare and getting building your confidence back up and providing a better future for the children. Yeah. And I think that is also really important. I think that we hear a lot about people trying to build businesses as fast as possible and trying to, you know, scale as fast as possible, get to an exit as fast as possible. And at the same time, you know, you're saying here that it was so conscious, the decision to build a business that was just going to go step by step you weren't going to take well too I say much that money. because then we went to the other extreme but right. yeah but we definitely during that period when I was still really fragile and just trying to get my life back on track um so for about the first two years we did go very very slow but then the it just grew sort of beyond our plans projections everything and we got some analysts some men to run our KPIs um and we just and they were sort of blown away by retention rates and AOVs and CACs and all of that then we would felt like we knew what we were doing enough that we could that it would really help to scale the business quicker and what do you feel like was the most the biggest turning point in the business's growth we were right quite right place right time because it was all about comfort and the other thing in 2008 when I first started um researching and developing the product you had Victoria's Secret at one end you know very male gazy really uncomfortable because you look at the runway shows now of all those perfect figures and everything and it's just like how was that only yeah, how did like, that ever how was that happen? ever okay with a man in a suit mm. with gray hair at the front like going look at my ladies <laughs> look um, at my angels my angels and then you had Mark Spencer's at the other end which was uber comfy but dressed like your granny like your Bridget Jones pants so it was, that was why the knickers I was like why is there nothing cool and comfortable like the same way Tyler you know you throw on your leggings every day and you're kind of set it's the same with our knickers it's like you just want to put them on and women have better shit to do than worry about wedgies VPL right uncomfortable pants so um me too happened in just as we launched so I think that was another seismic shift in women kind of like going what the fuck I'm still dressing for a man I'm still doing all this when I think we realized we weren't quite where we thought we were mm. um and then COVID I hate saying COVID was good for us but we we were selling comfort it was online so we were able to keep trading um so it, it was just quite the first three or four years were just we couldn't keep up with growth we couldn't keep up with demand mm. Um, but yeah, I think it was, um, then we also did a lot of podcasts, actually, weirdly, we sponsored a lot of podcasts, which, which really, no one else knew about podcasts, but because I was an avid podcast listener, right? I um, was like, well, we need to start sponsoring podcasts. So we did a bit of that and no one else was doing it. So the rates were really cheap. So that just made us go boom. Like we worked with um, Dolly Alton and Pandora Sykes, which was really fun. And then Fern Cotton. So we, we can't do it anymore. But um because it's there's, it's quite a crowded market now. Right, yeah, no, but, absolutely. Um, at the time, that really that really few because I didn't know about paid market marketing. I didn't know that I should be paying Google or Meta or whoever all of my marketing dollars. But so I we were doing fun stuff with it rather yeah. than that. So it was a really happy good time. And how did you spot those opportunities? I always followed what I liked. My team, I'm laughing. I'm laughing because my team think I'm so woo woo. I'm all about like I'm really into like manifesting. And when I was going through my shit, podcasts actually were a really big part of like the right. healing process. So we started off really small. We just gift. We had no paid influencer. We wouldn't be able to pay influencers to talk about us. We would just gift people that we liked and followed and said if you like us, talk about us. But if you don't, don't. Um, so it just snowballed from there, and eventually it was like right, it's time to take the plunge and invest in something. And the first one we did was the high low. Did you ever listen to the yes. Hilo? Yeah, with loved. Dolly and Pandora. Yeah, that was the first one. I remember it was sixteen thousand pounds to sponsor four episodes, and it was so much money for us. We'd never spent any money on marketing at all. But I was like, I really think this is going to work. I really love this podcast, and I think everyone loves Dolly and Pandora. So we, we, you know, you've got to take a few risks as well, haven't you? Yeah. We didn't bet the house, but we it wasn't far off betting the house. And I'm interested in how you managed to kind of get back that need to take risks mindset when obviously you've just been through something so 
that probably felt like the result of someone else's risk gone wrong? That's such a good question. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, but I, I think I was, I was so motivated. The business had to work because it yeah. was all we had. It was all we had. It was our way out of everything that had gone on and one day only. I still don't own a house, but what, that's like my dream is to buy mm. our own house and that sort of stuff. But um, it had to work. So I had to grow it quite quickly and we had to take some risks. Do you know what? I don't even know. I don't know the answer. I don't know why, where that confidence and trust that that was actually going to work came from. I have a theory. <laughs> if Tell you'd me. like to hear it. I would it. love it. <laughs> so two things. I think that part of it is that probably you're truly and intrinsically an entrepreneur and that's what entrepreneurs do and I think entrepreneurs end up as entrepreneurs whether they like it or not so you know you've said many times that you wouldn't have thought of it as a career and that you believed that we, like at that point you'd been told by society that we needed to rely on men and your job was in the house and like all of these different things you still found entrepreneurship so I think that <laughs> says a lot the second thing I think is that when you hit rock bottom you stop or you, your mindset shifts so completely in terms of what is a risk and what isn't a risk. And instead of that being a risk, it's the opposite. Not doing those opportunities is the risk. That is so funny that you say that because probably my biggest fear, and this is since childhood, has been not finding out what I'm made of. How funny now that all this has happened to me with that. But my biggest fear would be getting to 80 and going, oh, what if I tried that? Like. What, what if I'd given it a go? There are a lot of people who would have gone through what you went through and kind of given up or there was a latched moment on I to was someone like, else. I'm just going to go to Thailand and read books and eat noodles for the rest of my life. <laughs> I, honestly, it was a proper consideration. <laughs> but I think that what I say in terms of like not taking those opportunities would have been the risk is that like when I was at like my rock, rock bottom with Tala, I think that I was the best entrepreneur version of myself during that time. It was the most horrible time of my life. And I literally look back and I just think like, how, how did I survive it? Did how I get did through I that? Yeah, yeah, I spent. That's what I look back on now. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, but when I... you have no choice, you just do. But that's what I think. And I think that that's what makes those things such formative experiences in terms of changing your life. I, I always credit that experience that went on for like over a year. And like one day I'll fully like tell the whole story. Because every time I tell it to someone who I know, they're like, oh my God. God, and it is like absolutely insane, <laughs> and it's nothing. Books, don't we? <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think that with that, actually, you really, you really see what you're made of. But on top of that, the self worth that you develop. I've always said that I've never had imposter syndrome since that happened. Like I've never had imposter That's syndrome. That's true. I don't because you know exactly what you're made of, and I think that everyone can take this. The self worth you get from going through something fucking horrendous is tragic and it's horrible that it has to come from that but I do think the thing that people have in common who have gone through really horrible things or gone through really life-changing or months and months years and years of genuinely being like am I going to make it to tomorrow I mean, without like I, my, that used to run through my brain all the day all the time tomorrow might be better tomorrow might be better mm. and that really kept me going I now get total control over my life I don't I know a lot of women my age who are dealing with ex-husbands who are like quite controlling with finances and lives and sort of mess them around with schedules I am so deeply selfish I am in bed watching Netflix by nine o'clock what I want to watch on Netflix I eat what I want you know I've got my children I can bring them up how I want and everyone's always like oh have you met anyone new and I'm like fuck that no <laughs> yeah. I just like being selfish at the moment and just yeah. controlling my world and so with that in mind, because you say you obviously were built, brought up in a way where certain things were expected and a certain life was expected, how would you have brought yourself up differently in a way to mean that you didn't have that kind of mindset? Um, I, think it, I think it's, hopefully I'm doing it with my daughter. It's about that self-worth and self-belief and believing that you are just as good as any other person in the room. You're not better, but you're certainly not worse. You know, we're all equal. Everyone's got their strengths. Everyone's got their weaknesses. But you will have something in you 
that you're great at and you just need to find that and you'll be better than anyone at some things but it's about knowing that you will have those skills and to believe in yourself Mm. you have to work really hard which I was always happy to do and always wanted to do but yeah it's about just the self-belief the the accountability, the confidence to go for what you want. Like if you told me I would be running my own business, I would have been like, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. How would I do that? Like that. But it's anything is possible. And I hope my daughter really sees that. I just want her to be brave enough to fail. I think a lot of women have that fear of failure. Certainly women of my age, a lot of my friends are like, God, oh my God, and how you do what you do. What if it doesn't work? And I'm like, well, it will work because it has to. And I just have that un deep to my soul belief that it will yeah and it's very it's so interesting because I do think again it's we've been taught as women to fear failure because of the way we see women who do fail I think that you know our view in the media of women who fail our view of entrepreneurs like female entrepreneurs we can all name the big ones who have been over every single newspaper of a kind of like I told you so type press like the men just can't wait to say I knew she couldn't do it right but it's also of our own making because we put them on a pedestal (laughs) because we cannot believe that a woman would be in that position subconsciously and we big them up and we say this is a person who has it all and the second they make a decision that wasn't the right decision which is not only likely but required of for example Mm. an entrepreneur we take away all of their value because of one single failure which is why we're so ingrained to be terrified of failure and actually I hadn't thought about it that way but I think you're right that is why I think it's so important to see women failing publicly and for it not to need to be gracious, for it not to need to be in a kind of accepted way, but for that just to be part of the narrative. I I know that you're passionate about the female entrepreneur statistics as much as me. It's my real, everyone always says to me, oh, you're passionate about sustainability. And I'm like, no, actually, I just feel like sustainability is something that if you start a business, you should be doing. Right, It's just part of the process. Whereas my deep to my soul, passion is women supporting women having each other's backs truly believe like we rise by lifting others Mm. I wouldn't have got my business off the ground if my mum hadn't given me free childcare I mean I would have been screwed and weirdly being an entrepreneur is sort of the perfect job for a a single mother because you can pick and choose your hours but also women just don't have the confidence I think that's a big part of it to 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 give to take a risk to take a chance and so what advice would you give to another entrepreneur or another woman that's trying to build their confidence there's no secret magic bullet to being an entrepreneur it's just a lot of hard work a lot of resilience I'm such a believer in resilience well obviously given what I've gone through but I think there was a Harvard business review that yeah. said actually 90% of success is grit and I believe in that because it is about who can get up the most and keep going yeah and even when it knocks you because it will knock you god it's there's not perfect there's still tons of knocks that come in but I'm much better at dealing with that stress and just going, not not getting caught up, not losing sleep over it, just mm. finding a way through it. And I've yeah. made sure to surround myself with people who balance out my skill set, um, where we can lift each other up if someone's having a bad day, there's someone else to pull you out of it. You know, just surrounding yourself with the right people, do the work, really hard work. Make sure you've got a product you really mm. believe in. How did you come to launch your first product? Um, in general or with Tala? With Tala. With Tala, it was, it took about a year specifically because I wanted, well, I originally started looking for activewear brands that I could work with because at the time I wasn't considering starting another business at all. And I just realized that sustainability wise, none of the ones that I Mm. currently had within my, um, kind of zone were something I would like to support. I mean, I just realized that they were kind of just fast fashion. Um, And I looked for more sustainable options. Um, At the time, there were very few and the ones that there were were about double the price of the others. And so I really originally had just wanted to be sponsored by um, a company that was doing that. It was just wasn't anywhere and no one was interested in it as well because they weren't interested in the margins, which is the conversation to have with anyone who uses better fabrics than anyone who doesn't, Uh, than anyone else. I know, Um, and we're the same as you. We work so hard to keep our price point accessible. Right. But sustainability is just never going to be the cheapest option. Right. It just won't be. And so I 
just ended up talking to loads and loads of people and ended up um, partnering with a factory partner who was really interested in the concept How of trying to make it. factory? Just through these meetings, actually, that I was having to find people who kind of... I was initially wanting to potentially co-found the brand, like all of these different things. And I ended up just working with a great factory who had just had like a 20 million euro investment into their sustainable technology. Oh, wow. And so they were really interested in the concept, whereas everyone else was really wanting to get as much as high RRP as possible for the best sustainability. Mm. I wanted to come in and say, okay, well, if we could even bring that 100% down to 92% recycled, um, the... RRP came down by over half and we were able to get pretty close to the price point of the brands my friends were buying. Yeah. Um, and so they were really interested in that kind of ethos because they hadn't seen anyone else doing that. And they were like, <laughs> well, it seems impossible from our side and looking at the margins. That you like which being it told no. Been. Like being told no is probably my, my right. favorite thing. As soon as um, someone says that, I'm like, mm, I'm gonna show, I think it's possible. I'm going to show you. Yeah. So we kept playing around with the composition. Um, and at the beginning I was like, no, don't want to take it down from hundred percent recycled. I don't want to, like, otherwise we're, you know, putting elastane content out into the world, all of this. And then I was like, well, if the only other two options are pay double or buy fast fashion active wear, then actually there's absolutely a middle ground where when people do choose to buy, it's such a better it can option be better. For, yeah. for, at a price you can actually get it into people's hands. Exactly. And we don't need one person being perfect. We need lots of people being imperfect and trying to be better. It's interesting, actually, when I was doing the knickers, and I think because I'm like you, not from a formal fashion background, mm. and I think in some ways that was helpful for me because I couldn't understand why there were all the heavy elastic seams in underwear which is what gives you the VPL and the wedgie mm. and all those things. And so the, actually I spoke to about two or three factories at the beginning and they said, oh, well, you can't design a pair of underwear that's going to stay in place and not fall down without those elastic seams. And I was like, well, if you put the lace like that and you do this flat lock stitch, I think you can. So I actually had to persuade a factory to even sample it. I was like, well, why don't you just sample yeah, it and see if it lot. works? And that's where it all came from. And I was like, this yeah. is perfect because you don't get the digging in. So that's why it's, um, but yeah, I got a lot of no's as well. And so do you think that entrepreneurship is a truly viable option for women who've really been through it, as you say, left with a huge amount of debt, a huge amount so of kind the, of... So I'm part of this group and I, a lot of the chat on there is what are we going to do about these statistics? Mm. This one, two percent depends which piece of research you believe. Either way, not great. <laughs> Let's call it oh, two. Let's be five. generous. Yeah. <laughs> but what are we going to do about this? And um, I asked our VC, why don't you invest in more female businesses? And they said, well, it was actually a woman. She said, we're desperate to. We're desperate to. The problem is, is we get a business plan, lands on our desk. First thing we do is take the numbers and we halve them. And then we go, right, if they do 50% of what they say they're going to do, is it still going to work? The problem is, as women, before they send it in, because they're risk averse, they've already done the halving. So by the time the VC does the halving again, you're down to 25%. So what business is going to work at 25% of their projections? Not many. Um, but I know you know this because I saw it on your stories this morning. But as we know, the average investment into a female lab business returns 50% more so mm. but because it's been set up in this patriarchal way the investment system I think it's mm. very much a man's world so that means that because the, the halving process that goes on it it's like we it's like are oh, probably more cautious by nature but still take the right risks I don't know how to say mm. it without sounding kind of sexist but yeah no, I do think, I, I mean, I've definitely like faced this myself. I think that um, myself and, and Morgan, who I run Tala with, she is, I mean, one thing we say every time we talk to investors is we will hit every single number we say we will. And we can say, and so yes, we can take the projections up for you but we will hit these numbers. We would rather surprise exactly. on the upside. Yeah, and what we've done every single year is we have over-delivered and we have hit every single number we've said we will. And we've said, you can talk to any single investor who we've worked with and they will tell you- no I've one, heard that from the exact so same. many of my investors. Exactly. It's like, we look, I look forward to getting your report because- you would have, you're, you're going to surprise me on the upside. Right. And it, the problem is with then with the VC world, especially in this kind of traditional 
more US based VC, all of these types of things where people are being given tens of millions at pre-seed stage before they've even got a penny uh, tested an idea. Yeah. Um, is that it is all based on imaginary numbers, obviously with some, you know, guesstimation. <laughs> um, but actually that, you know, there is part of that in it. I do, however, not think it's women's fault. And I do think that there is an element of it where the- No, it's not our fault at all. It's the, it's the pressures we put on ourselves, our lack of confidence. It's the, Yeah, but even then that sounds like a does it sound women blamey? inflicted does issue. I, I, I mean, I, you know, there will absolutely, every time I talk about the kind of funding thing and people are like, not trying to be rude, but is there an element of it that like women aren't trying to go for this funding as well? It's like, oh, this could account for some of it. It's not going to account for 98% oh, no. of it and, and all of this. There's a really interesting TED talk about that, about the difference in language used. A massive study was done on it about the language used. Some researchers sat in on investment meetings. So, you know, the entrepreneur going to a VC or whoever and saying, invest in me. The language that was used that was negative in the female meetings compared to the male mm. meetings, it was off the charts. Women get asked all these negative questions. Mm. What are you gonna do if it fails? Mm. What are you doing to, to protect, protect the risk? Whereas the men were all being asked questions like positive, like, you know, just, just, just completely different. Mm. So yes, it is, there's an intrinsic bias. Women have so much more family pressure on them they're not in a position to take risk often, whether that's looking after small children or elderly parents or running the household. Um, so there's that side of things. Um, there's the um, the childcare, I think, is massive. Like, if I hadn't had free childcare, I wouldn't be able to do this. And I'm so grateful for that. But how do we fix that for other women? I know that they've reduced the rates and things, but it's nowhere near. Yeah. It's nowhere. Because it's the burden of it still massively falls on the, the, the woman in the house. And if you're a single mother, it's 100% on you. Um, and, then it's, and then it's the confidence. And I think, God, you're going to be amazing for future women, my children, my daughter's age, because it's, it's, I don't know, if you could see it, you can be it. it that's 100% true. Well, I think that is a perfect, very frustrating, but perfect way to end. Um, I think we could talk about this all day. I know. I just want to take find a way of taking positive, I think we're people who like to see results, probably. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we'll, we will find a way to, to change these numbers. We will. We will. Watch this space. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you Thank so you. much, Grace. <laughs>